And in this uh, past two months, we depicted this series with this picture. Thank you, Pam. Pam Demetilio, are you here? Wala siya dyan. Ah, nandun. Oh, yes, Pam. She made this design. And you know what, Pam? To me, this is the picture of CCBC. Really. You know, God pouring His blessing, His anointing to each one of us. And He does it copiously that we may be a blessing to others. And that is why we entitled uh, that picture really depicts very much our series that we have entitled as Greater Works. So part two of this, meaning, you know, September series would be focusing on addressing the question of how God uses His people to accomplish His purposes. Israel was called to be on a mission with God, to be a blessing to all nations. So it is with the church of Jesus Christ. We are called to make disciples of all nations. We are called to do something that is God-sized, that is larger than us. And in all of these stories from the book of 2 Kings, it is our prayer that you will discover that in serving the Lord and being used by God, it is all about God's sovereignty and it is about His glory. And today, September 29, we are going to focus on the last uh, episode in Elisha's life. And, that, and I entitled this, These Bones, The Legacy and Power of the Man of God Lives On and Keeps on Making a Difference. I'd like us to stand up in reverence to the reading of the Word of God. And we are going to consider 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 to 21. Now Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows. And he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot! And Elisha said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the Arameans at Afek. Then he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. And Elisha told him, strike the ground. And he struck it three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. Elisha died and was buried. Now Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the, the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. Amazing, isn't it? Now, what does it mean to us? This is what we are going to consider this morning. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, speak to us. Speak to us in a special way. As we look into these last days and some days hereafter, Elisha's death, we pray, Father, that you will cause us to know how to live that kind of life where we truly make a difference where our life count in your kingdom, in your kingdom purposes, whether we are weak and aged or we are dead. Thank you. Teach us today. We open our hearts to you and our ears speak to us in a special way. Amen. You may all be seated now. You know, when I and my wife served in Hong Kong, we took a job as um, what you call that customer relations personnel. 
we reach out to those who have come for the first time in Hong Kong, debrief them, listen to their experiences, help them thrive, so not only survive, but even thrive and finish their contracts. So, almost every day, our routine is to listen to them. And we would hear stories like this. And one of the big problems between Filipino workers and Hong Kongers are, is communication. You know, they speak English, but they don't understand each other. The Hong Kongers have a different way of using English from the Filipinos. Let me give you one example. You know, this young lady came to us so frustrated, she almost got fired. She was saying, well, what happened? Well, my, my employer claims that I don't listen. I don't know how to speak English. So how did it go? Well, it started... One morning before my madam would leave, she is giving me instructions, you know, what kind of dinner she would serve. And she was telling her that, he is, that he was, she was giving this instruction in this manner. Okay, okay, this is what you do. Huh? You see, when the water begins dancing, you throw the skeleton in. And then, of course, the Filipina... Helper was taking a back, Ma'am, Madam, uh, can you please repeat that very slowly? Okay, you make the water dance, and when it starts dance, you throw the skeleton in. And she didn't get it, and she says, you know, Madam, can you please demonstrate? Oh, your, your, your English is poor. I thought you could speak English. You know what? Let me demonstrate it to you. You take pot, you put water, put it on the stove. You see, when it dance, you throw the skeleton Okay, ah, so pag kumukulo na raw yung tubig, ilagay ang buto-buto, ayan. Anyway, I'd like to talk about these bones. These bones that startled us, you know. These bones of Elisha, well, we're not talking about dancing water and putting these bones, but these bones that brought a dead man to life. In this story, set of stories in the life of Elisha, we are going to take a look of what it means for God to use us for His greater works. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Let us run the race with endurance. Let us run with endurance the race that is set for us. You know, a life of doing greater works is really a marathon of faith and a journey of faithfulness. Keep in mind, if you, you would like God to accomplish greater works through your life, don't expect it to be a one-time, big-time thing. Yes, perhaps there may be an Elijah moment in your life, but the way God would accomplish His work through us is not through a Samson pushing the post of a temple, and that is it, one time, big time, and he's dead. But it is a life of faithfulness. It is a life of experiencing his presence. It is a life of endurance until the end. And there you could see the greatness of the work. Somebody, someone has said the best way to measure a tree is when it is fallen. And he's not talking about trees, but he is talking about life. The best way to measure a man's life is when he is dead. That is what a proverb say. In this last episode of Elisha, it tells us just that. You know, the significance of his life. And it tell, this set of stories tells us that Elisha's life was a life of unwavering faith in God. And it is a life of God's demonstrating His faithfulness to Him and through Him. Let me give you a little background. Here on this chart, Pastor Philip placed that for us. These are, these are the chart. It's hard to see it, but let me describe it to you. These are the list of the kings of Israel and Judah. Uh, Israel started as a united kingdom, but after Solomon, Solomon there was a split. Ten kings uh, went on their own, while uh, 
ten tribes rather, while two other tribes uh, separated from them. And it is the southern kingdom, and this is the northern kingdom. And these are the least of kings, and you could read that in First and Second Kings. And through the book, it evaluates its king. Uh, in this chart, you know, the king is regarded as good if it is, their names are written in green, evil if their names are written in red, and gray if, kung, you know, medyo-medyo lang sila sa kanilang function. And you will notice most of the king, and I would say all of the kings of the northern kingdom were regarded as evil. And you will see the summary in each of the chapter. You know, this king did evil in the eyes of the Lord and he continued on in the sins of Jeroboam, their father. So they went on through a tradition of evil reign. And through this time, God sent prophets to call these kings and the whole nation to turn around from their evil ways, to turn around from idols and to turn back to him. And there are prophets like Elijah and later on Elisha. And here, Elisha and Elijah serve in this period, from the period of Ahab, the king, to the period of Jehoiash. Jehoiash. So it's a period of one, two, three, four, five, six kings. Uh, um, Elijah was the leader up to uh, the leader of the prophets up to the time of Azariah, and then Elisha picked up from there and up to the time of Jehoash. And tried to compute, you know, the years that Elisha served. She, he has given as much as 65 to 75 years, depending on the estimates, of active service to the Lord. 65 to 75 years. To us today, typical career would be about 35 years, 40 years, mahaba na. Ito, 65 to 75 years of unwavering service to the Lord. Impressive. And he served up to his time of death. So after the succession of several kings in both Israel and Judah, we find the prophet in this story that we've read in his last moments. Now let us take a look at this last moment of Elisha. So we will see here his faith and his legacy to us. So there are two parts in this narrative. It talks about Elisha's faith to his last breath and it talks about God's faithfulness even past the grave. Even past the grave. So Faith to the last breath of Elisha and God's faithfulness even beyond death. You know, this message really is for all of us, but particularly, you know, many of us who are advanced in age could identify this. And what I would like to emphasize here, reflecting from the life of Elisha, is this. God can still use you, even if you're advanced in age even if you are very ill. In fact, Elisha was dying. Yet King Jehoash came to him to visit him, to honor him, to give him comfort, and to ask for his ministry. Let's look at verse 14. It says there, Now Elisha had been suffering from illness from which he died. So it's terminal illness. Imagine he is very old, 85, 90 years old. He's very weak. He has this illness. And according to scripture, this is the cause of his death. So this is his last days. He is terminally ill. So, the narrative continues on mentioning Jehoash. The king of Israel went down to see him and wept over him. This time, we find a king who genuinely admires and respects and honor the man of God, Elisha. Jehoash is the, the, the grandson of Jehu. If you know, last week we talked about the reign of Jehu, how he destroyed, the, dismantled the religion of the Baals. 
and perhaps Jehu encouraged his sons and his grandchildren as Elisha has prophesied that Jehu's reign will be up to the fourth generation. So they owe a lot to, Je- uh, to Elisha. And here Jehoash comes to honor Elisha. And he said, my father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. You know, this is a beautiful picture. Elisha has not yet died, but here is a king honoring a dying old person. I remember way back in 2008, my father's cancer is advanced in its stage and felt that, you know, he is already terminally ill. So back then, in his birthday, April 12, the family decided, let's throw a big party for dad. We invited his friends from Saudi Arabia, friends from Laguna, friends from his old workplace, partners in business, and people from church. And many of them came. And that program, friends begin to, in the program that we had for him, friends begin to stand up and just honor him and just tell him what kind of impact his life had towards them. And towards the end of the program, he took the mic and he began to speak to the crowd and he said, and I can never forget this, thank you for giving me a eulogy while I am still alive. It's such a pleasure to hear that. Thank you for not holding back until when I am dead by saying these kinds word, kind words to me. And then I came to realize, you know, sometimes we take the people around us for granted. We begin to think about the good things, the good impact, the influence they had in our lives whenever it's already too late. You know, many people, the first time they would only receive flowers is the time when they are already dead. Why don't we give flowers while they are still alive? And I think this is what Joy is, is doing. You know, now he sees. And he took this time from his busy schedule as a king to honor a man who deserves to be honored. How did he honor this man? He said, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. What is that phrase? You know, that phrase was used for the first time by Elisha himself addressing Elijah. My father, my father, the chariot and horsemen of Israel. He said that while he witnessed the whirlwind taking Elijah up to heaven. It was a statement of grief, but at the same time, it's a statement of honor. To make the long story short, it was a statement, it's a title being given to the prophet. He is saying, you're the defender of Israel. You're the key why Israel was protected and safe. You are the helper of Israel. In essence, that title, Jehoiash took it and gave it to Elisha. Elisha, my father, my father, the most respected one. He was grieving, he was crying, we are losing a defender of Israel. We are losing someone who will protect Israel. (coughs) That is what, (coughs) that is what uh, Jehoiash was trying to give. In other words, he honored Elisha even before his death. But there's one surprising thing. You know, one thing about Jehoiash, he came not only to honor, but he came because there's a big need. He came in desperation. The Arameans had reduced Israel into a mere heap, barely an army. It reduced, they were able to occupy so much of the land of Israel. The economy was now smaller. Their territory is much more smaller. They have decreased population, a good for nothing tribe surviving in the lands of Samaria. He still needed Elisha's help. But you know what? Elisha responded take note matanda na siya take note may sakit na siya very weak and yet what did he do as usual this setback is actually a, defined, a divine setup for faith 
Unlike his predecessors, King Joash had faith in the prophet and the God of this prophet. But the story shows a stark contrast of faith. So let me tell you the story. Elisha, he asked, according to Pastor Phil, in the way he sensed the Hebrew of this, there was an effort in saying this, perhaps an effort of an old and dying man trying to speak. He said, Joash, get a bow. Now, and then perhaps he tried to get up from his bed. He held the hands of Joash, perhaps in an act of benediction, in an act of prayer, blessing. And then he asked Joash, Joash, open the window to the east. Shoot an arrow. And Joash did likewise. He shot an arrow. And then Elisha said, The Lord's arrow of victory. You are going to be victorious over Aram. You will completely destroy the Arameans at Afek. Wow, what an encouraging word. And then after that, he asked Joash to take out the arrows in his quiver. You know, back then, perhaps, a soldier would typically have six to eight arrows in their quiver, in their hand. So perhaps it was a handful that, that Joash was holding and then Elisha gave the command, strike the ground with arrows. Strike the ground with arrows. And perhaps Elisha was observing with intensity in his eyes as Joash take one arrow and put it on his bow and struck the ground. One arrow down. He looked at Elisha. And Elisha's eyes perhaps were saying, get one more, get one more. So he took another arrow and he struck the ground as he struck it. But Elisha's eyes perhaps was urging him, get one more, get one more. And he did it again for the third time. But this time, Josh died, decided to stop. I don't know what's going on in his mind. But you know what? If I were Joash, perhaps ang nasa isip ko, sayang. Sayang naman yung arrows. Tignan nyo, nasira na yung tatlo. It will be useful. In other words, you know, he just stopped. And here, Elisha gave his prophecy. You should have struck the ground five or six times. Dapat inubos mo yung palaso mo doon. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. Now you will defeat it only three times. You know what? What Elisha is saying to Joash, Joash, you know what? Y your heart is lukewarm. You don't have the passion. You're not giving it your best. You know, you're holding back. If you're going to do the will of the Lord, give it all. Give it your best. Give it your whole of your strength. You lack passion in doing so. That was kind of a rebuke that is given to Joash. So here, we find the faith of these two men in contrast. One is the greater faith of Elisha, and the other is the weak, groaning faith of Joash. And what is that? Well, Elisha's faith is mature, while Joash's faith is mediocre. If you ask me, Pastor, anong Tagalog na mediocre? It's medio-medio lang, you know. Uh, yeah, I have faith. Mustard seed. Mga ganyan. <laughs> yeah. You know. And then, the faith of Elisha is insightful. He could see where the Lord is leading. He could sense God's hand moving. He could hear when God is speaking. Pero si Joyash, it's impervious. Now you'll ask me, Pastor, what is that? Ano sa Tagalog yan? Wala lang. Yun yung Tagalog nun. Yung, di ano, okay lang. Ganyan. Not affected. You know, I'm not affected if God does not speak. Then, 
does not speak. I'm not effective. If God does not move, then He does not move. Parang ganyan lang. Okay, okay lang. So, in contrast naman, Elisha's faith was passionate. While Yoah's faith is phlegmatic. Ano naman yung phlegmatic, Pastor? Yung ba yung lumalabas pag inaubo ka? Hindi po. <laughs> phlegmatic. Parang ganun na rin. Parang ang lapot mo kumilos. Parang, uh, you know, you're not excited. Parang hinihila ka mula sa higaan mo. Sunday na naman, sisimba na naman kami, magbabible na naman kami. Ano ba ito? Magkakwiet time ako, puyat naman ako, or something like that. You know, there's, there's just luck luster. There's just nothing. No excitement, no sense of drive. To be with the Lord, to do what the Lord wills. And that's the difference between these two men. And you know what? What is it that we could draw as we look into the Elisha's last moments, its faith and legacy? We see Elisha's faith to keep on, even on his last breath, even on the last stages of his life. One Pastor of CCBC, I remember the late Reverend Roger Baldemore in one of his sermons, and I can't forget the phrase that he declared to the congregation back then. He was already sick, he was already suffering from the symptoms and the effects of diabetes in his life, but he declared, Brethren, you know what I desire in my life? When I die, I want to die with my boots on. And what he was saying, I want to die with the things that I love to do and that is to serve the Lord. And I would like to die doing it. This is Elisha's attitude. You know, he's already weak, sickly, and old. But his heart, his passion, his faith, it's still like a heart, passion, and faith of a young, strong person. What does it mean to us? Especially to us who are here, who are advanced in age. Sometimes, you know, you'll say, Matanda na ako. Mahina na ako. Sakitin na ako. Therefore, inutil ako. Don't say that. Yes, you may be old. Yes, you may be sickly. Pero alam mo, in God's eyes, you can still be used by Him. You are special and God can still use you. And to us here, perhaps you're not old, but you're having trouble with your feelings. You're 25 years old, you're beginning in your career, pero ang feeling mo, retire na ang puso mo. <laughs> but, and feeling mo parang, dahil with a series of failures in your work or whatsoever, you felt, ano ba ito? You know what? God can use you. God will use you. And perhaps, you know, as you pursue your career, much of your weaknesses begins to be magnified and you're frustrated about that. It's causing you to stumble. But you know what? The Lord's promise said that God will use the weak things of this world to shame the strong and God will use um, the, the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. The point is, if you partner with God in His work, it would be God working through you. That will be the miracle. It is not merely your work. It is the work of God. You remember the call of Jesus? If you have faith as small as what? Mustard seed. You can say to this mountain to move from here to there. And what will happen? It will move. So the question, what moved it? Is it your faith or is it the hand of God? It is the hand of God. Your faith is the means to partner with God for things to happen through you. So when 
Elijah, even at his advanced old weak stage in his life, God used him mightily. Why? He exercised faith to partner with God to accomplish the things that God would like to accomplish through him. Kaya kalabitin mo katabi mo. Say to your neighbor, God can use you even in your weakness. God can use you. And sabihin mo naman sa katabi mo, kabila, never give up. Don't give up. God can use you. It's not all over, kapatid. It's not all over. Gagamitin ka ni Lord. Okay? Now, let's look at the next stage of this story. The stage where Elijah is already buried. And still, we see God's faithfulness even past the grave. Verse 20, the death of Elisha was described. Elisha died and was buried. Now, Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. We could, can you imagine that in the picture? My funeral procession. At merong mga ambush, they want to run, so they have to dispose the body immediately. They didn't think. They just enter into a cave, kasi yung mga tombs nila parang cave, and just threw the body to, psh, bala na, takbo. But what happened? Here it is. When the body touched Elisa's bones, the man came to life and stood up his feet. What? Amazing. Why, why did God do that? What, what, what's the point of this miracle? Why, why is it in the Bible? This is it. It's an awesome commentary to the life and even death of a man of God. This little episode tells us that God's faithfulness carries, carries its divine impact long past the earthly lives of men and women in faith. Take note, what touch the dead man, it wasn't Elisha's cadaver, but it was Elisha's bones. Naagnas na, skeleton na. So about three to five years na siguro ito. And the man went alive. So, what he's saying here is God can still use a person even if he's dead. Let me show you. First, Actually, that story is a prophetic speech, prophetic narrative for Israel. It's a message of hope. It's really a promise from God saying, Israelites, you may feel dead right now because of your enemies, but I promise you, you're going to overcome. You will find life again. It's a promise of God to the Israelites. And it's a demonstration of the power of God to revive them from their dying state. You remember Joash coming to, his, to, to, to Elisha. The setting was that their, their country is shrinking, their territory is shrinking, their army is shrinking, their economy is shrinking. It's going down, it's going down. They're on the verge of death. The fact is, 100 years from this incident, the whole nation of Israel practically died in 722 BC. The Assyrians, a great army came and they took over Israel and they dispersed everyone in Samaria and the Israelites, they scattered them. So there was no nation of Israel to speak about at the time. It is dead. But this prophecy and along with many other prophets was telling Israel, you may have died. But the power of God can resurrect you. And today, there is this new Israel that God has promised. You know, that small incident is a demonstration to encourage the Israelites to, to keep on their faith to Him. Why? Because though they may be dead, they could be alive again. I remember that incident in the life of Jesus when his good friend Lazarus passed away. And he came over, but it was too late. The funeral is already happening. 
Martha came to him and he said, Lord, if you have come earlier, he should not have died. And then Jesus said this famous statement, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall not see death, but they shall live again. Do you believe that? And Martha said, I believe that. I believe I'm going to see my brother in resurrection day. And that is a fact. But many Israelites do not believe. So what did Jesus do is to demonstrate his power. That he has the power to make the resurrection a reality, a resurrection from the dead and reality. So what did he do? He resuscitated Lazarus to tell the people around them that the resurrection is possible and that he has the power to make it happen. You know, to many of us here, CCBC years, there are many things, though we are still alive, it's already dead. You feel dead now in your own self, sense of self-worth. Dead na yata ako sa karera ko. Dead na yata ako in terms of, you know, I'm already dead in my relationship. My relationship with my work or my relationship with my career. Or worse, you know, it, it seems that my relationship with my spouse, it's already dead. There are many things perhaps that you feel it is already dead, but you know what? God's power is available and it is powerful enough to make that dead thing in your life alive again. So, my friend, it's not yet all over. There is always hope in God because He's powerful. His power is always available to us. His compassion never ends. And this is what God is saying to the Israelites, you may feel so dead at this moment, but I promise you, I have the power to bring back life to you. And another meaning of this incident has for us is the privilege. What kind of privilege? The privilege to figure in lasting legacies. The privilege that even if you're dead, even if you're gone in this life, even if you have passed working in this company and you have separated from and, and begin to work in another company or even before you have lived in this place and now you have to transfer to another place, the thing is, God is saying, your memory, your presence there will make a lasting legacy. And that's what he did with the life of Elisha. Patay na siya, pero may impact pa. I'd like us to pause for a moment. Can you think of a person that has been dead for many years now, but up until now, his memory still makes an imprint sa inyo? You know, a beautiful imprint in your life, impact in your life. We know many people like that, di ba? You know what? God wants us to live our lives in that manner. That not only in our youth, but even in our old age, we become His instruments of grace and blessing. And not only in our old age in this life, but even beyond our life, I pray that your life would always be a blessing. Your memory will be a blessing. It's an invitation from God to participate, to earn that have that privilege of a lasting legacy. So, the point is, God can use His people even to the last breath and past the grave. God can use His people even at their lowest point of weakness, even the point where they feel that they're old and sick. God's grace is there. Now the question is, Pastor, how can this be made possible? Is this all encouraging words only from you? No, there's a basis of this. Let's look back at the life of Elisha. You know, Elisha's secret is he focused his life on what matters most. And what is that focus? First, he is able to make a lasting legacy because of his life of faith. He believed God solidly. 
You know, when Elijah approached him and placed his mantle on, 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 on his shoulders, what did Elisha, how did Elisha respond? He, he responded immediately. He butchered his ox, fed his neighbors, and he burned his plows. He used it to cook the ox. In other words, he, he responded in faith to completely turn around from his former life into the new kind of life that God has called him to be. And he trusts God to provide. He lived a life of faith. And you know what? It takes faith to pray in this way, to ask Elijah, Elijah, give me a double portion of your powers. You know, it's bold faith. Lord, give me a double portion. What kind of faith is that? As I have mentioned to you in the past weeks, when God calls, He will give us assignments that, are, that is larger than life, that is bigger than us. And perhaps if you've been attending congregational meetings and we, we've been sharing with you, you know, how we see where God is leading us, perhaps some of you, nabibilaw ko, wow, ang laki. Wow, ang mahal. Wow, it's so big. Wow, liit naman ang offerings namin. Paano kaya yan? Paano kaya gagawin yan? You know what? To tell you honestly, God would never give you assignments that is as big as you are. It will always be God's size. You know why? Because it is a calling from Him for us to exercise faith. Elisha knew that. So when he saw from Elijah the, the, the hugeness of the task, he boldly asked, Give me double portion of your blessing, of your anointing. Why? Because the, the task is so big. Mga kapatid, let's not shrink back by trying to be modest before God. God, okay na ako dito. Ganito lang. Simply lang naman buhay ko. No. He wants us to ask boldly like the prayer of Jabez. Bless me indeed, Lord. Expand my territory. Give me the ability to do what you want. You have called me to do. And that's the kind of faith that Elisha exercised. Then second is obedience. Hardcore obedience. He he's, he. Never wavered away from the commands of God. Even if there's offer of wealth, offer of power, offer of prestige, he never wavered from the call of the Lord. Another thing that made Elisha's legacy last longer and really made an impact is the way he dealt with the people around him. He dealt with them with compassion. You remember his colleague's widow, you know, they are suffering from poverty. The children would be sold out to slavery. Elisha responded in compassion. And not only to a poor widow, but even to a wealthy Shunammite woman. He responded to her, not because she's wealthy, but because there was compassion on her. To the Aramean armies who are about to be butchered, and the Samarian king want to butcher them, and he said, No! He dealt with them with mercy and with compassion. You know, my friend, if you live your life filled with compassion and love for the people around you, that's another key of leaving a lasting legacy. Another thing about Elisha was his unwavering passion for the Lord. Unwavering passion to, de to see people honor God, turn away from his idols. You know, he, he, his passion comes to the point that he, it brings him to anger. If, if kings are living in mediocrity, if his fellow workers are not doing the will of God, it's an unwavering passion. It's a passion that burns on even up to the last days of his life. And finally, a spiritual legacy. Elisha invested in building people. You will, if you read through the narratives of Second Kings, there's this so-called school of prophets who is always around him and they recognize him as their leader. You know why? He invested in building up other prophets so that he does not have to do the work alone so other people may do it. And even if he's weak, even if he's sickly, even if he physically can do it, other prophets can do the job. He equipped them. 
He mobilized them. He helped them do what they are called to do. You know, in the book of Hebrews, it speaks about the life of greater works, as we have mentioned, as a marathon, a journey of faithfulness, of continuing in faith. It's a life that passes through, and yet it makes a difference. Let's take a look at this passage. Can you read with me? Verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. And what's the key? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Why? Because He's the pioneer and perfecter of faith. That's the secret. You may forget everything that I've told you, but you know what? The secret of Elisha was his focus. And to us, it means we focus our eyes on Jesus. That will make a difference in your life, a life that will truly build a lasting spiritual legacy to others. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Say that to your neighbor. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Before I read, I read to you a passage from one of the poetry poems of City Stud. Charles Thomas Stud was a promising young person back in the 18, 1880s, graduating from Cambridge. He's very bright, very talented, a superstar athlete. He has a bright career ahead of him to be a politician, to be a banker, to be a businessman. He is handsome. He is robust. He is strong. He is a celebrity kind of guy. But one day, J. Hudson Taylor went to their school and challenged them about the needs of China. City Stud, along with his six friends, sensed the call of God. And they responded to Taylor. They went with him back to China. They served as missionaries. And then later on, you know, as God led him, he served also in India for six years. He pastored a church among a people there. And it was there that he met his wife. And it was also there that her, his father died. His father was a wealthy person. So everything that his father owned was bequeathed unto him. There's, it's a lot of wealth. It's a lot of money. But you know what City Stud did? He gave it away. He gave it to missionaries. He gave it to an orphanage run by George Mueller. He gave it to different Christian causes. He left some amount of money for as he courted his wife so that you know he could show her that he has still some money for which they could live by. But when his fiance learned that he saved that money, she told him, Hey, we have turned our backs from all of these things. Why don't you give it away? And even that, he gave it up. And later on, the Lord led him to minister to, in, uh, to Africa. It was there that his wife died. And he kept on serving until a very ripe old age. He was born in 1860. He died in 1931. You know, a summary of his life was that he had fame, he had wealth, he had power, but he gave it all up in serving the Lord, in serving the Lord. And this is one line in many of the poems that he has written. It's a familiar statement here. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice. Bidding me selfish aims to live and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I'd like us to meditate on this message as Sister Arya sings us this song.